Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, you'll see this is a, a work of many people. Um, let's just make it as dark as we can. So there are two titles to this talk. And thank you. And, and, um, and the one here, uh, the Orphan Tsunami of 1700, is put in a, in a Japanese context with, with the word orphan rendered by these, these four phonetic uh, symbols. Is there a Japanese reader in the crowd? Must be. Chinese readers, for sure, right? No? But anyway, so Minashigo means, means orphan. And then these next two, they refer to a period of time uh, called Genroku. And it's, it's a time between 1688 and 1704. And it's much as if we were to say during the Depression or during, the, during World War II or something, or Civil War era. So it's, it's, it's a block of time. And then the last two are tsunami. And so in a Japanese calendar, instead of using the Western 1700, you use Genroku. I can't hear in the back. So okay. You use Genroku as the, as the, for, the, for the time. And, and, uh, and you'll see why we, we, we use the term orphan in just a bit here. Okay, so this is a detective story of sorts. And there's a part of the detective story that is set in North America. And then there's a part that's set in Japan. So the, Jap the, the North American part uh, begins in what we would refer to here as prehistory, I suppose. Uh, for geologists, that term is not very meaningful. Um, but still, I think we would, all of us would tend to view prehistory as, as OK, a time before written records uh, generated in the region. And, and so that essentially is the American Revolution. The time of the American Revolution is, 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 is when you start to get European explorers here and the written records from them. Um, so our, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a, a catastrophe in this region in the year 1700, but it falls in prehistory, so there are going to be no written records about it. There are written records like this one, many canoes came down in the trees from a, a story recounted to James Swan out in Nia Bay in northwestern Washington in, in 1864. And these could well be the, um, the, the uh, through oral traditions of native peoples, the, the accounts handed down through generations of, of the tsunami in 1700. It's a little hard to be sure of that. Um, <laughs> The, the earth science part of this begins, you could say, with the coining of plate tectonics, or the understanding more broadly that, that uh, we have uh, an oceanic plate diving under a continental plate here, and that helps to explain not only the, not only it helps to explain the, the, the volcanoes of the Cascades, but also uh, gives rise to the potential for very big earthquakes as happen on other subduction zones. But of course, our subduction zone doesn't have a history of very big earthquakes in the time of written history in the past 225 years, essentially. Um, so it, it took uh, seismologists thinking about this problem in the 1980s to in the late, late 70s, early 80s, uh, seismologists, geodesists, and they said, you know, well, maybe this subduction zone should have very big earthquakes, but we don't have this history of them except maybe these Native American traditions. So geologists like me got in the act in, in, the, in the 1980s, and that's my better side, in the, in the mud. And, and, um, and by the, by the, um, uh, by the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was clear from the, ge the, the work of, of, of people Scott mentioned in his introduction that, that uh, um, this subduction zone does, does have a history, a geologic history, of very big earthquakes and associated tsunamis. And that the most recent of these happened uh, with be sometime between 1680 and 1720 was the best we could do. Well. Um, Along comes 
along comes a part of a kind of geodesy that's that's able to do, to show unambiguously that the plates are really stuck together here. That in the in in 1995, and and that I think for geophysicists put this evidence for very big earthquakes in their bailiwick, and it made it more palatable to them. So. These days, I don't think there are very many dissenters um, about the occurrence of very big earthquakes here. Now, on the Japanese side, you have the, you do have written history going way, way back, you know, back into the 600s. And you've got um, written, you've got uh, for this, this quote here from, a do, from an account of a what the writer called a high tide that came into northeast Japan. And the writer was, was puzzled that there was no earthquake associated with this because the writer knew the association between earthquake and tsunami. So for him, this was, an or, in a way, an orphan tsunami. Well, these kinds of writings are, are available from Japan, but they were sitting there with nobody scientifically knowing about them until Musha came along. Um, in the years just before the war, and and um, we'll 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 go back to Musha later. But in 1942, um, by mimeograph during the war, he issued a catalog that uh, contains two accounts of a tsunami in 1700 in Japan, uh, a tsunami of of unknown and remote origin. Um, the the origin of that tsunami became known, or in a conjectural way anyways, uh, in 1995 with this publication in Nature with the, the inappropriate icon for a tsunami on the cover. Um, and and uh, this was worked by, uh, led by a Japanese scientist, Kenji Satake. And uh, Kenji familiar with, the, with these uh, written records uh, from 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 the time, especially of the of these daimyo of the the uh, working on uh, uh, how do I say uh, that that these were these were people feudal lords uh, who were subservient in a way to the Tokugawa shogun, but they administered their territories in ways that led to a lot of record keeping like this. So, anyways, um, the these accounts. Uh, from 1700 in Japan were linked to the North American geology by these Japanese scientists. They proposed that this link occurred, existed, and they proposed that our most recent very big earthquake and tsunami had occurred in, in uh, the evening of the 26th of January, 1700, and that the earthquake was probably of magnitude 9. And those pieces of information have been very, very helpful in terms of dealing with um, earthquake and tsunami hazards here because they, 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 they provide a precision in defining the hazard that make it easier for people to act on the scientific information. So let's look at, a, at a, just, just a, a Japanese um, public safety cartoon here. And we have an observant uh, cat and in addition to this person. It's a Western Pacific orientation, you're looking north and the subduction zone's going under you from the, from the east side, but you know, you could, you could flip it for our situation. And, um, and the, the cat's getting worried, as you can see, as the spring is getting loaded and then, and then things happen. So, but, but this, this, one is, this one is not an orphan tsunami, right? They feel the shaking. They know, they know the parent earthquake. Okay. So, so this is this is the situation. This is the North American situation in 1700. Not an orphan tsunami here. Okay, there are signs of shaking that we'll see. Okay, well, this this is a political diagram. Um, you can see that there's earthquake size on this axis and time running across for the past hundred years a, a bit more this way, and that during the Cold War, th the uh, planet was pretty lively with these very, very big earthquakes, okay? And then during the Reagan years, things got pretty calm. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can see what's happened recently. <laughs> okay, so, 
so labeled, here they are, um, 52 Kamchatka being the start of that Cold War series. And everybody knows 64 Alaska, 9060 Chile is probably the biggest of all. And then the, the Indian Ocean disaster triggered by the Sumatra Andaman.